What was your mother's experience in the famine? So your your family is from is from Bengal. Yeah, my um, mother was uh, about twelve years old, and she was living in the city. She saw uh, all of this starvation on the pavements, all of the people coming into the city from the villages because there was absolutely nothing left in the villages. And I had this question that no one seemed to have answered, which was, why is it that uh, no relief was sent? I wanted you to read a passage from your book. Can you just read the first paragraph? I, I thought it was this as a way of communicating to people what a famine is. In Shapurapota village of the 17th Union of Pashkuratana, a Muslim weaver was unable to support his family and, crazed with hunger, wandered away. His wife believed that he had drowned himself in the flooded Kashai River. Being unable to feed her two young sons for several days, she could no longer endure their suffering. She dropped the smaller boy torn from her womb, the sparkle of her eye, into the Kashai's frothing waters. Famines are the immediate result of things like droughts and crop failures, acts of nature. But their cause is invariably human. Wars, misguided policies. Right now, as I'm recording this, Venezuela is facing a malnutrition crisis. A country with vast oil wealth in one of the most fertile corners of the world doesn't have enough food. Humans caused that, not nature. So what was the human cause of the Bengal famine of 1943? Frederick A. Lindemann, born April 5, 1886, died July 3, 1957. He'd never admit when he was wrong. He'd never change his mind once it was made up. His friend Roy Harrod once wrote of him, he would not shrink from using an argument which he knew to be wrong if by so doing he could tie up one of his professional opponents. One time he's asked for his definition of morality, and he answers, I define a moral action as one that brings advantage to my friends. I'm guessing you think of Churchill as a hero, the man who bravely led the fight against Adolf Hitler. But once I learned about his friend, I don't know. The entire industrial production, the entire cloth production, wool, silk, timber, you name it, it was being used for the war. In wartime, countries operate right at the brink. And in late 1942, there's a kind of perfect storm in India's northeastern corner that pushes the region over the edge. First of all, the Japanese capture Burma, which sits on India's northeastern border. India used to import rice from Burma, now they can't. The British are terrified that Japan will invade India, and so they order a scorched earth policy all along the northeastern border and coast. They destroy stocks of rice, boats, bicycles, anything they think that might help the Japanese if they invade. Then there's a cyclone, 20-foot storm surge, kills 30,000 people. The new rice crop is devastated. The government panics. They don't know how they're going to feed their troops, so they go into all the towns and start buying up rice. The price soars. Speculators step in and start hoarding rice. That's exactly how famines start. What you have is by the end of 1942, you have the Viceroy of India making fervent pleas to the war cabinet in London for imports of wheat. The pleas go to Lindemann. He's paymaster general in the war cabinet, which means he's basically the government's logistics man the one responsible for making sure there are enough food and supplies for England and its allies. Lindemann says, no, we're in the middle of a war. We can't spare the food. And even if we could, we have no way of getting the food to India. We're tapped out. Throughout the spring of 1943, the Viceroy is saying, we absolutely need this. We absolutely need this food. And Cherwell is saying, we can't spare the ships. We can't spare the ships. But Mukherjee wonders... Is that true? Was Lindemann telling another lie? She then does something no historian had ever done before. She digs into the British shipping archive from the war, which had just been declassified, files that literally hadn't been opened in 60 years. And she finds out that the British had lots of food in 1943, huge stockpiles, so much that the Americans, who were the source of a lot of that food, got suspicious that the British were hoarding surplus wheat to sell when the war was over. 
And what about the UK's supposed shortage of boats? Mukherjee says there was one at the beginning of 1943 when German submarines were still wreaking havoc in the Atlantic, but not by the end of that year. The U.S. starts sending over so many ships that by late 1943, when the famine in Bengal is at its height, there's actually a surplus of boats on the Allied side. In fact, in 1943, the British actually start shipping wheat from Australia up through the Indian Ocean, just not to India. There'd be 18 ships loading with wheat and wheat flour over uh, in September and October, and not one of them were going to India. And some of them were actually going to a stockpile that was being built up in the Middle East for feeding um, Europe after liberation. British ships full of grain are sailing right past India on the way to the Middle East to be stored for some future hypothetical need. They might even stop and refuel in Mumbai, but nothing leaves the ship. So you have a situation in which India is starving. There are corpses on the streets of Calcutta. So why? Why is Lindemann refusing to help? It doesn't even make logical sense. Indian soldiers, hundreds of thousands of them, are fighting the Germans in the Middle East and Africa. When other countries like Canada and the United States offer to send food to India, the British say, we don't want it. They turn down help. Lindemann seems completely unmoved by India's plight. In my view, the Indians have got themselves into a mess very largely through their own fault, he writes in the middle of the famine. So why was Lindemann so adamant that England could not help India? Because Churchill was adamant that England could not help India, and Lindemann was a loyal friend. Churchill would send Churchill these uh, minutes. They had to be no longer than 10 lines long, and they would recommend a course of action. And to design these minutes, he actually left out a lot of qualifications, uh, the bad things that could happen if you did such and such. For instance, uh, in the shipping cut, the Ministry of War Transport had warned that uh, there'd be violent cataclysms in the economies of the Indian Ocean area. None of these concerns ever made it into a Cherwell memo. He actually simply laid out a rationale for doing whatever he and Churchill wanted to be done. The best guess of how many died in the Bengal famine of 1943 is three million people. Three million. After the war, the British government held a formal inquiry into what happened. But the investigation was forbidden to consider, and I'm quoting, Her Majesty's government's decision in regard to shipping of imports. In other words, they were asked to investigate the cause of the famine without investigating the cause of the famine. 